Hey, this is Jared Cochran with Family Church. Welcome to our podcast. I'm excited that you're here. I hope that God moves through this message to reach you so he can move through your life. Be sure to share and subscribe so that we can reach the world with God's word. Enjoy the message. Good morning, church, family, church. How are y'all doing this morning? Thank you. This is a wonderful time to be here. It might look crazy out there, but it is amazing in here. This is uh, Memorial Day weekend, so before I get going too much, uh, I want to thank everybody. If you were a veteran, thank you for your service. Uh, If you're still in, thank you for your service. And uh, if we can, just take a quick moment of silence for those that never made it out of uniform, because that's what Memorial Day is all about. They are the reason that we are free in this country. And Jesus is the reason that we are free in this world. This morning... Uh, I want to continue where I picked up off uh, last week, because any, if anybody's in here from last week and we heard from Acts chapter 1 and, and chapter 2 on Pentecost, uh, my favorite sermon to preach, and if you've never seen a leaf blower in sermon uh, on, in, a, in a church, you may as well go back and watch it on YouTube. That was, uh, I, I loved it, I loved it. But today, if you will allow me, which you're going to have to because I'm already up here, <clears throat> uh, we're going to pick up where I left off. A little bit last week because um, as I was studying for that message, that's what I'm saying, you're going to have to fight me for next week because I've got about one more in here, one more in the tank on this. There's a lot that God's doing on the Holy Spirit, so we'll, uh, we'll go out back after church and we'll settle it like men and uh, we will play rock, paper, scissors <laughs> and best two out of three wins and if not, then it's a five out of seven until it goes in my favor. I'm just kidding. If we can, church, please stand with me for the reading of the Word of God. Uh, I have quite a bit of, of text here today, but it's important for the context. If you're new here, we stand for the, for the Scripture, not for the sermon. So if you're like, I'm already tired of standing up, just hang on, you're about to sit down. Uh, Acts, two, Acts 2, not chew. It's already starting. It's already starting. Uh, I'm going to start in verse 1. We're going to get a little recap of last week. Um, <clears throat> starting in verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came... They were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. If you were here last week, you know about that suddenly. Did anybody get a suddenly this week? Did God show up suddenly in your situation? If not, just hold on because it's coming. In verse 3, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And last week, as we said, it was the Holy Spirit showing up after steadily seeking him because he's going to further your story to the next chapter. But everybody say, now, now, verse five, now, they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Y'all pray for me here. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia almost did it without stopping. Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. I feel like I just spoke it reading them two scriptures right there. (laughs) Verse 12, amazing, amazed and perplexed. Amazed and perplexed. They asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. And I'm stealing this, but y'all need to know when God is moving, people will be mocking. They will be misunderstanding you. When you are happy and they don't understand it, they will get hateful. They do not understand what it is that we are speaking to them. They don't understand what it is that we're telling them about. They don't understand why they need to follow Jesus because they have been blinded. 
couple more, and then I promise you can sit down. This next verse is why uh, all the pastors start getting passionate and they start yelling. Verse 14, then Peter stood up with the 11 and raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. For some of you, that's about four hours too late. I'm just kidding. Calm down. But uh, I really want to focus on verse six today a little bit. A crowd came together in bewilderment. The crowd was curious about a sound that sounded chaotic. It was confusing. So they come together. But this was not the sound of confusion. This was the voice of the Holy Spirit calling out and reaching out to every person in their own tongue. This is like the reversal of the Tower of Babel where God divided the dialect of men. And now he is using a sound that is confusing to call back out to a people stuck in their sins. Mm. This is not a natural event that is about to take place, but this is a supernatural epidemic that is about to happen. This was about to be the beginning of the spread of Christianity that would go out in waves from this place until it infected hearts so deeply and realistically that it spread to the ends of the earth. This is how the gospel got all the way from Philistine to St. Augustine. God, have your way. Speak through me, Lord. Let us hear what you, what you want us to hear, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. As you're finding your seat, tell your neighbor, I'm contagious. I am contagious. The title of the message today is Contagious Faith. Contagious Faith. I'm glad I wasn't preaching this a few years ago. If anybody remembers when we had that wonderful uh, scamdemic that wrecked through the country and uh, suddenly everybody cared a whole lot more about their hygiene than they ever had before and we spent way more time washing our hands than we should have and putting uh, ridiculous masks, masks on our face that did absolutely nothing other than make it hard to breathe and then look ridiculous as you're driving by yourself in your car to go to the grocery store and then touch all of the groceries that God knows how many other people touched and then you're going to rub your eye. It just made no sense. It made no sense. And yet, here we see what I would call a group of people that are about to take the Great Commission out into the world with an infectious passion. And somehow we have found ourselves today where there's too many Christians that are treating the gospel of Jesus like it's an evil virus. And we come in and we sit on Sunday and then we wash ourselves of the entire message before we even get out of the building. And then we put our masks back on to blend into the world so that nobody can know that Jesus is anywhere near us so that nobody even knows that Jesus is inside of us. And we just go out because society has somehow made us too scared to speak about the Savior. Too scared to step on toes. And I want you to know, if you don't know already, or if this is your first time listening to me, I'm not afraid to step on your toes. I'm more afraid that you're not going to encounter the living God and not be transformed. And then you're going to be subject to eternal torment. So you can stand a little bit of bruising on your baby toes for just a little bit. We don't have to avoid stepping on toes anymore. We need the spirit to give us a gut, a gut punch of glory so we can get back on the right path. And so we end up wandering around the world instead of through the world. And instead of transforming the world towards Jesus, we have let the world decide the effectiveness of our message because somehow political correctness is more important than the passion of the Christ. We are called to have a contagious faith. To share it with others, to spread like a wildfire and reawaken a world that is sleeping because they think they're dreaming of delight and instead they're heading towards a never ending nightmare. It is time, church, to wake up, to get to work, and to spread the world. If you remember last week, the first verse, uh, they were all together in one place, and, and I highlighted the importance of what it is to, to come into church and have that church community so that we can edify one another, one another and build each other up spur each other in love, spur each other into good works. It's important, though, to be surrounded by like-minded people because your friends will foretell your future. Bishop Veron Ash said that your friends are a prophecy of where you are going. So if you want to know where your kids are headed, 
Find out who they're hanging with after school. If you want to know where you're headed, look around at your close circle with who you're hanging out. Because whoever you are hanging out with more is going to determine the direction that you're moving. If I'm hanging about out with a bunch of fools all the time, my future is not going to look too great. And if you're spending no time with your wife, don't be surprised when she finally kicks you out on the curb and you come home to all your stuff on the, uh, on the lawn. If you don't focus on your kids, don't be surprised when they're in their teens and they don't want anything to do with you anymore. And if you don't focus on your job and you don't want to show up on time or show up at all, don't be surprised when they fill your spot because you are replaceable to them. But if you focus on Jesus, you'll get a future that is full, full of joy, full of happiness, full of contentment, full of completeness. If you focus on Jesus, then you know that you can flip to the book of maps and you'll know what goes on in the back of the Bible. And you'll know that in the future, everything is going to turn out all right. And so we see the people in the upper room are all seeking the same thing. They are like-minded. And that is why it's important to surround yourself with other Christians. And this doesn't mean that you go out and you toss the loss out of your life. Don't neglect the knuckleheads. Just because they might still be in the world a little bit doesn't mean you suddenly need to be like, well, I've been to church and Jesus doesn't want me to associate with you anymore. (laughs) Jesus was the friend of sinners. You've got to, uh, you know, have some boundaries. Some of y'all really need to know what boundaries are. Your ex doesn't need to be uh, your first priority at three o'clock in the morning when you're feeling lonely after a couple shots of Tito's. (laughs) Too real? Too real too soon? Nope. Good. You are called to still be a witness to these people. Just like Jesus was. He sat down and he ate with sinners. And if it offended you that I just literally made that joke, imagine (laughs) how Jesus dealt with the Pharisees in the same exact way when they came up and they called him a glutton and a drunkard because he was hanging out with sinners. He didn't come for the righteous. He came for the lost. But if you find that your character is being changed in the wrong direction, It's not you being contagious. It's you being contaminated. So you need to surround yourself with people of faith because it is contagious. Because you cannot be near the fire of God without feeling the heat. Something is going to stir in you. Something is going to move in you. Something is going to begin to change within you. You can't be surrounded by people on fire for God without feeling that change begin to happen inside of you. Unless you are actively hardening your heart against it. If you keep resisting God's direction for your life, eventually it will be repulsive to you. Ooh, 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 too much. Okay. We've got to stop sitting around trying to get warmed by the fire. We don't need to be warmed by the fire of the spirit. We need to be completely consumed by it. You are wasting your time trying to warm up to being a Christian. You're wasting your time just sitting too close to God to feel his warmth. It's time to jump in completely head first to dive into the depths of his glory, the depths of his unending power. It is time to be consumed by the spirit and be contagious to the world. Hmm. And the people, like I said, they are in the upper room and they're all seeking and praying for the same thing. And they received it so that. The gospel would then spread. It would be infectious. They could go out and be contagious with Christ, for Christ. But they were focused on getting more of Jesus. They were focused on getting equipped for the mission that was ahead of them. They were focused on pursuing him, on getting that dose of the ghost so that they could see the others take their medicine, like I said last week, and be contagious with the message of the Messiah. Now we're ready to preach. Now, verse five, now there were staying in Jerusalem, God fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. This is where I left off last week. See, we always get too focused on the what that we forget the why that God had in store. And there's so much more to to your why and your weight than just learning patience because God's God's intention for your life is never going to match your imagination. It's never going to look how you think it's going to look. It's never going to turn out exactly how you think it's going to turn out. You can sit there. This piece of hair is driving me insane. (laughs) It's not turning out like I thought it would. 
And perhaps you're waiting on the one thing that God is sending, and instead he's sending something completely different into your situation. Maybe you're waiting on a better job opportunity and you're waiting to become a manager and just make a little bit more money. But he's waiting on you to be a little bit more faithful where you're already at because you're not ready to have the responsibility of where he's trying to take you to go. And he wants you to be successful where you're at before he will send you where you need to go, because you have to learn to be faithful with the little before you can have the responsibility of the much and be faithful with the much. And all the ladies are elbowing their men and uh, ladies, maybe you're waiting on your mans, you're waiting on your mans and you're waiting on, uh, on your Boaz and he's waiting for you to get uh, your butt back together just a little bit more and have a little bit more maturity before he sends you your Boaz. Y'all, we need to stop focusing on the glow up and start focusing on growing up. The glow up will happen. The grow up, you got to work on it. And if who around you is contagious, that is why it is so necessary to be around people with a contagious faith. That's right. Because faith is not the only thing that is contagious. Distractions are contagious. Happiness is contagious. You can be having a bad day and just walking somebody, by somebody in the right way and their smile can be contagious to you but if you're one of those creepy guys that walks by a girl and you're like hey you would look a lot better if you would smile please shut up and stop doing that that's not working for you at all that is the worst pickup line in the history of man that is not in my notes but the holy spirit needs y'all to know that love <laughs> can be contagious love can be contagious if, if if you're not loving yourself and somebody shows you a little bit of kindness that will be contagious and that will push you to be a little bit more kind to other people. Generosity can be contagious. You might be hoarding your money or maybe living in a lifestyle of scarcity and you're afraid of where your finances will go, but if somebody starts pouring out into you a little bit, that can be contagious and make you pour out into others. But apart from that, fear is contagious. This is why you see in disaster situations, everybody collectively loses their minds and they all start trampling one another because the fear spread around because it is contagious. Anxiety can be contagious. You can be about to do anything and having no thought at all. And then somebody that has a little bit, and I'm not trying to knock people with anxiety, but they could say that one little thing that'll trigger your anxiety. And they'll, you know, you'd be like, well, we're about to take a trip. Well, what if you get a flat? And what if the weather's bad? And what if there's too much traffic? And you're like, I didn't think about any of that. And what if now when we're driving down the road, you get a flat? And then what if when we're on I-4 and you're, you're fixing the flat, a semi comes and it flattens you across the pavement. And now the kids and me have seen it and we have no idea what to do. And then we lock ourselves inside of the house and we have no idea how we're going to get on with our lives. Anxiety can be contagious. Anger can be contagious. You can be having the best day of your life. The best day of your life. And somebody says that one wrong thing at the wrong moment. You read that one wrong comment at the wrong time and out the window it goes. You get cut off by the wrong person in traffic. I'll move on. Stupidity <laughs> can be contagious. I'll move on again. Complaining can be contagious. Complain. Have y'all ever seen, and if this is you, please stop. And this is not like my TED talk, but those people that when they're at like a, a restaurant or a business, and something's wrong with them, but now their problem needs to become your problem, and they're looking for like a little army to get together and complain with them. Kelsey went the other day to, uh, to pick us up some food. I told you I was putting this in the sermon. She went to get us food, and I, somehow uh, when she called it in, thank God for the right restaurant this time. Can't pay attention. Uh, she called in. The ticket didn't make it from the front to the back. <laughs> You're not doing sound anymore. The ticket, the ticket didn't make it from the front to the back. So when she got there for our food, it wasn't done yet. And there was some other guy there. I don't know what his problem was. I wasn't there. But uh, I guess he was losing his mind that something was wrong with his order. And he was doing that thing where they're like, can you believe this? Can you I look at this. This is terrible business. How did they do anything around here? Complaining can be contagious. If you're that type of person where you could have looked at the fact that your food was wrong and their food was wrong, and now all of a sudden you're screaming at a girl who did nothing other than answer the phone and say, welcome to sushi, like, can I take your order? 
and then she was supposed to just push a couple buttons and suddenly you're you're attacking somebody that had nothing to do with the situation and you don't know anything that they're going through and if all of these bad things are so contagious that they can infect us in ways that are detrimental how much more important it is is it that we have a contagious faith to drive back the darkness in people's lives because people are looking to you to see how you're going to react to the things that are going on in your life. If you look at verse six, when they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment. People will start looking when things start moving, whether good or bad, they are going to come to see what is going on. And if they are watching you go through something, they will see how you respond to it. And they will want to see how you respond to it, especially if they're on the fence about coming to church or coming to Jesus, they're going to look to see if you're just like all those other Christians that were in their life that got mad that they wore uh, pants before they came to church instead of a dress. And that's why they don't go to church anymore. So what does your example of faith say to those who see you respond to your circumstances by getting up and persevering in the purpose that God has given you? When they see you running around as a single mom with a smile on your face and they have no idea how you're doing it, they will ask you, how are you doing this? When someone sees you working harder than everyone else in your department, but they make more money than you and they know that your position isn't making all that much money and they know that your bills probably aren't really getting paid, but somehow all your needs are still met, they're going to wonder what is going on in your life. And when they see that you are waiting on a miracle, but you're still praising him for the last one that he gave you, and you're praying and praising him for the one that is on the way, that is contagious faith. And it is in those moments that you are given the opportunity to be contagious with your faith, to share your faith in Jesus, to share your joy in Jesus. And we see, we see on the day of Pentecost, the spirit gets poured out and the crowd is drawn to the sound. And there was a reason for this weight. There was a reason for the, for the weight they had to endure. Remember, this is, this is 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus. This was 10 days after Jesus ascended into heaven before the Spirit filled them. 10 days. Some of us can't go 10 minutes without being distracted. And sometimes you can't even make it 10 words in your prayer before you're already given up and moving on to the next task. But that's okay in a sense, because as long as you're praying to God, he's not worried about the time frame or the structure to it. He just wants you to get real with him, to get real with him, to quit hiding things from him, because he already knows the situation. He already knows every thought you have. He already knows the anger and the bitterness and the pain behind every thought that you have. But what you see in the present is not the purpose, and only God knows the purpose. So they waited 10 days for Pentecost, 10 days days. And there was a reason for the wait. And I literally already told it to you. Can you put verse five back up, please? Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Oh, y'all don't get it yet. Oh, it's good. I love it. This is so much in me. Oh, they came from everywhere for this celebration. What was Pentecost? It was the Feast of Weeks. They were celebrating the end of the grain harvest, the first fruits. People were pouring in from all over. So God literally waited until there were Jews from everywhere before he poured his spirit out on everyone so that the gospel would then spread to everywhere as fast as possible. This is contagious faith because when you see a wait, God is already making a way. And when you don't see the reason, he's getting ready, ready to reveal it to you in time. So stop looking at the pieces that you're missing because God is the only one that is in charge of the entire board. And so when you're wondering what God is doing, and when he is going to show up, he's moving this piece to that place, this person to that place. He's taking that person out because they don't need to be there anymore. And he's moving this one into the position that they need to get to. So when the day of Pentecost comes and the spirit is ready to breathe out into you, the whole board is set up so that everybody will see the overflowing presence of the living and mighty God. When you see a weight, God is making a way. 
know they were impatient. All the people that are like super crazy about the Bible, like, no, that's not in there. That's not in there. You know they were impatient. I'm telling you, you're not spending 10 days praying for something that you don't know is going to show up and you're not at least a little bit like, any minute now, God, voice is sore. I need some water. 10 days, 10 straight days. They didn't have the ability to see the future for what God knew what was coming, but they had the faith. Oh, this is, this is the part I was telling you about. This is a, uh, oh man, this blew my mind this week. If y'all remember, there is 120 people in the room with them as they're praying for the spirit and waiting for the gift of the spirit. And if you can't make the connection, because I wouldn't have made it, and I've seen it this week. The last time there was people like this, 120 people gathered together, was when Solomon first dedicated the temple. 120 people blowing trumpets to dedicate the temple. And then there is 120 voices then, and there is 120 voices here at Pentecost. So just as the 120 men blew trumpets to dedicate the first temple, God now sends a mighty rushing wind. He sends a violent wind. He sends the spirit with the breath of life to blow on 120 people at Pentecost. If you're still not getting it, there was 120 trumpets for the old temple, and now there's 120 tongues of fire for the new temple that is being dedicated. 120 trumpets and 120 tongues. We are the new temple, church. We are not built by human hands, so it can't be destroyed. And so where the people used to have to go up to the temple, God came down to make a new temple, to make you the temple, to make a mobile temple temple to make a temple that can move that can be relocated that can go out into the world so instead of the people having to come up to a place to worship God God made the people the place so that the place could go back out into the people contagious faith God waited for everyone to get there before he moved in so his message would move out God was waiting for everyone to come in before he would move out. And the crowd is confused. And some are mocking. And then Peter stands up shouting. And he begins his sermon. And notice, which camera? What camera one? Notice for all you view internet trolls that Peter, Peter did exactly the opposite of what you think. And he didn't go verse by verse by verse. Peter starts up and he gives the prophecy found in Joel, referring to the last days. And we are in the last days, church. Ever since Jesus re uh, ascended into heaven, we are waiting on the countdown for the return of Christ. But he didn't go verse by verse by verse. And they say that is the only way you're supposed to preach. That's not the only way that's supposed to preach. That's just the way that you want to hear it. And not that anything is wrong with that, but I'm really tired of people that just come up on a platform and they think, oh, if you're not doing it the way that I like, that's not the true gospel. Amen. Did anyone read the Sermon on the Mount? Because I don't think Jesus went verse by verse by verse by verse either. And the problem with that is if I get up here and I go to go by verse by verse and we start in Genesis 1, how long is it before I get to the blood of Jesus so that you know that your sins were forgiven and that you were saved? We're going to make it to Leviticus and then you're going to leave and cuss. Leave it and cuss. There is nobody that, is, that has never been in church before that is going to sit for however the amount of time that takes to get from Genesis 1 until the atonement for their sins if you're only going in a certain direction. And again, if that's your style and that's what you like, great. That's, there's nothing wrong with it. But we, we spend so much time arguing over completely pointless things that don't matter at all. God's up there with a face palm going, would y'all just tell people about me in any way? Because we all work for the same boss. We're just in different departments. And you might be in finance and we're over here in marketing and we can't do it without finance and we can't do it without marketing. But finance can't come in marketing and do what marketing does. And marketing definitely ain't going to go into finance because they're asking for way too much money than finance is wanting to give them. So Peter gives the prophecy that was in Joel. Hmm. And then he goes back in 
and speaks to the prophecy that David gave. So he seems to kind of be all over the place. And again, if you were going by the Internet's rules, Peter is a false prophet. <clears throat> According to the Internet, somebody will clip that little part up. <laughs> so continuing the story, Acts 2, 22. This is part of his, his sermon. I skipped ahead a little bit for the sake of time. <clears throat> Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited to you, accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, which God did among you through him. How do you get contagious when God starts moving through you among the people that you are in and it starts spreading back out? As you yourselves know, verse 23, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible. It was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Y'all are way too quiet for something that is so easy for God to do that he came down and forgave you of your sins. There is nothing impossible for God. If he's going to leave his throne in heaven to come down and atone for the mess that you are in, how much more is he able to fix your finances? How much more is he able to get the gas in your car that you need to continue to getting into work? How much more is he able to save your sons and your daughters from whatever hell they're going through and all the drugs that they're dealing with and all of the people that they're hanging out with that you know is the wrong crowd? How much more? Because nothing is impossible. No thing is impossible for God. If he can beat death. And y'all worried about the price of dairy. (laughs) Me too. Uh, $9 for a 12 pack of Diet Coke. I mean, what are we doing? Uh, I looked at it. I had to walk away. I was like, I can't, I can't, I can't even get Diet Coke now. I don't need any emails about how Diet Coke is horrible for you either, because, okay? I don't care. I will send it right to spam, and you won't get any more <laughs> messages into the church. Oh, God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. That was always the plan. If you remember my Easter sermon, that was the plan, that Jesus would always go to the cross. He had it planned out before the earth was formed, before you were a gleam in your daddy's eye. He was already planning for Jesus to die and be resurrected for your sins. That is how much God loves you. That is how much he wants you to return to his arms. That is why he wants you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that is why he wants the Spirit to completely fill you. Not just getting the down payment when you get your salvation. He wants you in abundance. 30, 60, and 100 fold. And guess what? Those are all different. I don't know about you. I don't want to operate in 30 fold. I don't want to operate in 60 fold. I want to be operating in 100 fold. Mm. And he filled Peter. I love this. This is so bold. And, and you, you put him to death. He is literally saying this to a crowd of people that 50 days earlier were shouting, crucify him to Jesus. This is insane. But this is what happens when the Holy Spirit is inside of you. That is the boldness of the Holy Spirit. Like Elijah, like John the Baptist. You killed him and he knew it was coming and he still laid his life down for you. But you did it. And we look at this and we're like, yeah, Peter, you tell him. How could they? How could they be so stupid that they killed the Messiah? They murdered the Messiah, the one guy they were waiting all this time for. How stupid could you be to do that? And yet, church, it was my sin that also put him on the cross. And it was your sin that also put him on the cross. See, the Bible is the living word of God. And just as Peter is letting them know in this moment, I believe he's also letting us know that we put him up there just as much as they did. And no, we didn't physically do it because obviously we weren't alive. And if you were, I guess you're Dracula. I don't know. (laughs) But he met each of us there and bore every ounce of our sin. He paid the entire debt for our death sentence, all because he loves us. And if you didn't know, he did it 
for your sins. He did it to redeem you. He did it to restore you. He did it to save you, to deliver you, to heal you, and to set you free. And for anybody that's got a messy past, this is, I I love that this is Peter. This is Peter. It makes it so much more powerful. Because Peter was not always like this, if you've read your Bible. He was the one that cut off Malchus's ear when they went to arrest Jesus. Cut a dude's ear off just because they went to arrest Jesus. Peter was also the one (laughs) uh, that Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. When Jesus told him that he was about to go get crucified and Peter was like, no, no, don't, don't do it. This can't happen. Peter was well-intentioned, but he was looking at it from a human perspective. He was prioritizing immediate comfort over the sovereign plan and will of God. Comfort. You don't need a comfortable faith. You need contagious faith. Faith that makes other people get a little bit uncomfortable because of their convictions that the Holy Spirit is pointing out to them. And now, now Peter is the one that is boldly proclaiming the gospel to these people and pointing out how they crucified Jesus. And if we look in his past, in Luke 22... He was also the one to deny him three times. And obviously, this is in all the Gospels. I picked Luke um, strictly because we're in Acts, the other book of Luke. And starting in verse 54, then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard, and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. He sat down with them. And a servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight, and she looked closely at him and said, this man was with him, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. Uh, Luke kind of helps Peter out in this because he leaves out the part where Peter was cussing and cursing and swearing. So uh, not like the cussing and cursing and swearing from today. He, he literally, uh, in the other, in a different translation, it says that he invoked a curse on himself. And then the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. I don't know if y'all have ever gotten, like, the death stare from a parent. This had to be the absolute (laughs) most soul-crushing stare. I told you so, everything, all in one. And then it's God, so you're like, "Ah, ah." sorry. And then Peter remembered the, the, the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Three times he denied Jesus. And obviously he went on to do much better things. And I don't really want to bring up his lowest moment, but I do want to, want to sit here for a minute. As he sat down, he sat down by the fire to warm up. And then, you know, this girl, she's kind of like side-eyeing him, like, you look a little familiar. And you know he's nervous. Now, I know this is family church, and everybody is too holy and too sanctified. But for anybody who's not afraid to admit it, have you ever been driving around high, and you pass a cop, and then you're immediately paranoid? You know that feeling. Or maybe you've had just a little too many beers, and you know you're not supposed to be driving, And then you pass the cop, I'll move on. But you understand the paranoia. So you can imagine that Peter is a little bit nervous while she's looking at him. Because I know I would be. And then she's like, use one of them. Use one of them. And uh, in the language, as my kids would say that, I don't understand. He was like, stop the cat. He said, no, no, I don't know him. And then a little while later, the same thing. You also are one of them. And he denies it again. Strike two. And remember now, 
they have been traveling around with Jesus for years. And they have performed many signs and miracles and wonders and preaching. John says that they only wrote down a little bit. So we don't get all of the stuff that they did. And if you know, there's the feeding of the 4,000 men and the 5,000 men. The estimates for that are somewhere between like 15 and 20,000 because of the women and children. There's been a lot of people that have seen Peter's face. A lot. And so I'm wondering when the third person comes up and they recognize him and the Bible says he was cursing and swearing. Do you think, and don't stone me, don't throw your family, your family church pins at me. Do you think that while he's denying Jesus, he's going as far as trying to use his old identity? And I know it says Peter sat down, but remember, this is Luke or Mark or John or Matthew that recorded it. And it says Peter sat down, but Peter was not his name originally. And I'm not trying to add it in, but sometimes you've got to put a little imagination while you're reading the Bible in order to kind of understand stuff. And if I'm, if, if I'm going by my name that Jesus changed and gave me, but I'm trying to distance myself from him, I think I would start trying to use my old name, the one that less people would know about. Because maybe they won't know me if, uh, if I tell them my old identity. Because, you know, that's why people backslide. They go right back to what they were doing before they met Jesus, because the easiest way to remove yourself from the presence of God is to re return to what the devil had you rooted in. Maybe the people at your job won't ask about Jesus if you keep on living like you've never met him. Maybe the people in your school or your family won't ask about Jesus if you keep living and talking and walking like the old you before Jesus put his spirit in you and called you to raise your standards up just a little bit. So I see Peter sitting by the fire saying, no, I'm not him. I'm not Peter. I'm Simon. My name is Simon. I don't know that guy. Never seen him before. I, I swear. I don't know. Him. I'm Simon. I'm not Peter. You got the wrong dude. He's doing all he can to distance himself from this situation. And I think, I think in that moment, I do. I think it was Simon more than it was Peter. Because this was a low moment. I think it was mentally Simon back at the surface. Because that's still who he was. And he's worried that they'll crucify him too. And that worry makes him weak in this situation. But know this, that Peter only denied Jesus out of weakness, not wickedness. This is why we have to be filled with the Holy Spirit, because we may not be denying Jesus with our words, but we can deny him with our weak actions. And it is spiritual weakness that leaves us more susceptible to temptation and opposition. And this is why we need the Holy Spirit to strengthen us and to defend us, to push us past the pain of yesterday and to pull us towards our purpose, to pull us to focus more on our faith in Jesus instead of focusing on the fears of our problems, to pull us into growing a little bit more each day, to pull us towards speaking out to others about not just what is right and wrong, but what is good versus evil, to pull us towards loving one another and speaking out against sin so that the spirit can convict them of their need for Jesus. And Peter was weak in this moment. And we have weak moments too. Moments where we will begin to doubt and it kind of creeps in and we'll wonder about our calling. We'll wonder about our situation. We wonder where God is at. And when he is going to show up. But it is in these moments that it is so important to remember 2 Corinthians 12, 9. His grace is sufficient. His power is made perfect in my weakness. So you need to know today that it's okay to be a little bit weak. It's okay to acknowledge that you don't have it all together at this moment in time. But you've got a God who has sent his spirit to comfort you, to anoint you, to restore you, to redeem you, to reinvigorate you, to breathe life into you to breathe life into your situation and to show up and show out like never before in your life and to turn the page on a new chapter so you can continue in the calling he has for you. It is in my weakness that he is merciful. It is in my weakness that he is kind. It is in my weakness that he is loving. He is faithful. He is patient. He is strong. He is standing up for me.
Because if I look at the verses, like how I imagine the things that Peter said, Luke twenty two fifty five. Can you put that one up, please? Who's on there today? Who's on there today? Thank you. No, you're fine. I was just want to say thank you. Thank you for, for candy. Y'all thought I was going to like tear it apart. Peter sat down. But if I imagine it, he sat down struggling with Simon, struggling with old habits, struggling with old tendencies, struggling with his old identity. Because a new identity is not going to immediately change your old habits. Right. Nothing is going to just flop like that. So I think, I think Simon sat down more than Peter. But now look where we were in Acts 2.14. Acts 2.14. Mm. Simon sat down at the lowest moment of his life, sitting by the fire. And then in Acts 2, I promise you it's there. It's okay. I gave him a lot of scripture. There it is. Then Peter stood up. <laughs> then Peter stood up. Y'all are like, I don't get it. What's it, need for, what's it mean for me? What does it mean for you? Peter's faith is contagious because of where he came from. Because you have a past and I have a past. Because Peter had a past. Because Simon sat down, but Peter stood up with the spirit still in him. See, the first time that he met Jesus, he fell down and said he was a sinful man. And then after walking with Jesus for a time in ministry, he still stumbled a little bit and he sat down. That should show you that it is okay that you don't have it all together right now. It's okay that you're still a little bit messy. It's okay to struggle sometimes. Sanctification is the lifelong process. So don't give up halfway because God is never going to give up on you. So he fell down and then he sat down. But each time he got a little bit higher. Each time he got a little bit closer to God. And now he is at a different place in his life because the spirit has been poured out into him. Because sin took a seat. Because shame took a seat. Because depression took a seat. Fear took a seat. Your addiction will take a seat. Brokenness will take a seat. Everything in his past and your past will take a seat. So the spirit will stand up to, to stand up in your situation. Some of y'all need to tell your Simon to sit down. Tell your Simon to shut up. There's no more time for Simon says. It's time for Peter to preach with power. It's time to tell Peter to stand up. Tell your Simon to sit down. It's time for you to stand up. It is time for the spirit to stand up and speak out because when the enemy wants to attack you, you need to stand. When he wants to remind you of your past, you need to stand. When he wants to tell you that you're not good enough, you need to stand. When he wants you to wallow in your depression and sit down, you need to stand. When he wants you to use the powers that be to tell you that a man can now be a woman, you need to stand. When he wants to tell you that there's more than two genders, you need to stand. When he wants to tell you that's a little boy who can't compete in a boy sport can now go into your daughter's locker room and shower with her you need to stand up when they want to tell you that the bible is just a bunch of mumbo jumbo it's time to put your foot down and stand back up for jesus the holy spirit is calling on people today to stand back up Quit sitting down by the fire trying to get warm because you're about to get burned unless you get your blessed assurance back up and take a stand for the kingdom of God. Stand up and be more than a conqueror. Stand up and speak up. Stand up and stop bowing down to the culture. Stand up and call sin out for being sin. That's not hateful. That's love. Stand up and remind the world that there is a savior who came and died for them. Stand up and let the Holy Spirit take control of your life and strike at the hearts of those around you so that they can hear the gospel of Jesus. Look at what happened after Peter stood up and spoke. Verse 37, 41. I'm getting close, I promise. I know y'all ready to go to Texas Roadhouse. Get them that them wonderful rolls and whatever that cinnamon butter is. That is just God put that recipe in somebody's heart and he was like, tell them about Jesus. Over the rolls. Let's get that for communion. Somebody run up there real quick. We're having communion after this. Go get some rolls. <clears throat> Verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart 
and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words. Y'all worried about me going an hour. Jesus went several days and Peter's in many other words. If y'all think this is too long, uh, let me tell you, eternity is going to be a train wreck for you. You know, uh, oh, never mind. You know, I got time. I got time. It'll take a minute. I got a real bone to pick with people that don't want to make any time for Jesus, but you want Jesus to make a whole lot of time for you in heaven. Verse 41, those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. 3,000. Peter's faith was a contagious faith. And this is the whole point of the contagious faith and the effectiveness of the Holy Spirit's convictions over people's lives. These people literally hated them. They hated Jesus and they killed him less than two months before this. And now 3,000 of them are repentant and turning from their sins to follow Jesus. Can you imagine if that would happen today? Because it should be. I don't know why we're not seeing this kind of revival already, I think it's coming, but it's time for it to happen. We need to be seeking the spirit every day to bring revival into this world and to wake us all back up to the power and the authority that we have in Jesus. Can you put 41 back up, please? I'm making you work today, Candy. 3,000. That sounds so good, don't it? It does. Look at the first part. Those who accepted his message. That means a whole lot of people didn't accept it. Not everyone accepted it. I told you that there was a reason for the wait. And all the Jews were coming up to this place for the celebration for Pentecost. I read. Oh, it seems like such a down note now. (laughs) I read that those numbers could have been anywhere from 200,000 to just under 1 million. I'll still take the 3,000. That's 3,000 lives changed. From everywhere. I'm not reading all the places again. Y'all remember them. If not, look it up after church. Everywhere. 3,000 people that would now go back and they would be contagious where they were. And there's no telling how big that number would be. That is a powerful picture of, of contagious faith. And the reality is that, yes, so many people will still reject Jesus. But that should never mean that we should stop. We should never stop. Faith is contagious, but so is fear and shame and anger and hatred and bitterness and porn and lust and drugs, fast food, all kinds of stuff is contagious. But Christ is what needs to be the most contagious. And until we step out of the way of ourselves and stand up in the spirit, we are failing as Christians to continue the great commission and to love one another and show the world that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We have got to stop washing our hands of the hope that we hear on Sundays and get back to being so contagious with Christ that an epidemic breaks back out and there is another overflow coming back in. And I think today God wants us to learn from the weakness of Simon and strive towards having that faith like Peter, to be contagious for Christ because Jesus called us out of our wickedness so that we would be his witnesses. Y'all could come up. And the last part of Acts, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts and they broke bread and I felt like I said that wrong. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. The Lord added to their number daily Those who were being saved. He added to their number daily those who were being saved. Daily.
daily, the Lord added daily. We have got to be with the Lord daily for the church to grow daily. If you're wondering why your family's not saved, it's because you're not daily. If you're wondering why your kids are going crazy, it's because you're not daily. If it feels like you've got no peace, maybe you're not being daily. If it feels like you've got no joy, maybe you're not being daily. And if the church is not growing, it's because we are not being daily. And that doesn't mean you need to come into the church every day. It means you've got to be the church every day. And it is time to have a contagious faith. It is time to be a contagious Christian. It is time to spread the gospel with a ferocious fire and to witness again so that we can change the world and wake them up to Jesus. It is time to make victory go viral. To make victory go viral. To have the faith like Peter. Tell your time, uh, your Simon to sit down and let the spirit stand up. Be spirit led. Like my Scarface shirt apparently says, according to you. Spirit led. He will guide you. He will speak to you. He will tell you what to say, when to say it, who to say it to. He will give you the strength that you need. He will give you the words that you need. But if you keep resisting it, eventually you will harden your heart enough that you'll be repulsed by it. And you won't do anything ever again for Jesus. And he did so much for you. So much for you. There was nobody else that could do it. There's nobody else that would do it. Even if they try. He has been so good to you. He's been so good to me. He's been so good to every one of us. And it is time that we share his love. It is time that we share his gospel again. And not just coming in on Sunday and eating fill. And then going out and starving for the rest of the week. We don't need a Sunday snack. That's why I go for an hour so y'all will get a little bit of spiritual Tupperware to take home and go study and do something with it. I don't need anemic Christians. I need you to be obese in your spirit. Not in your physical body, but in your spiritual body. And today, I pray that the Holy Spirit has reached you in some way through this message because it spoke to me in so many ways. And there's still so much more that I want to say. But I won't keep you here all day. And I just, I just pray that you're touched somewhere, whether you're in here physically or in, in the building or you're watching online. Just know that Jesus loves you. And he died for you. But it doesn't end there. He wants you to follow him. He wants you to know that he is your Lord and Savior so that you will change your life through him. That you'll follow him for the rest of your life. And he wants to anoint you with his spirit. He wants to fill you with the spirit. To to fill you with his power. So that it will overflow to those around you. So that it will be infectious. It will be contagious. So that all the world may know. To the ends of the earth. That we will know. And in a minute they'll sing... One more song, and I invite you, if you need prayer, if you want prayer, come forward. There's people that will pray with you, will pray for you. If you don't know what to say, you don't have to say anything at all. Just come sit in his presence and let him move through you. Let him work in you. And the Holy Spirit will literally guide someone to you, and they will know what to say to a situation that you don't even know how to explain. Let's go out and let's be contagious, church. And if there is anybody today that has yet to accept Jesus, I want to lead us corporately in a prayer. I say it every week. Y'all probably tired of hearing it, but it is not a magical prayer. It is a chance to believe the Bible and uh, confess with your mouth, if you you believe it in your heart, that Jesus is Lord. And we do it together, whether it's your first time or whether you're just returning. If everybody can, after me, Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending your son who died for my sins and rose again that I may live and live abundantly. Jesus, today, 
I make you my Lord and Savior. And I will follow you the rest of my days. Amen. If that is the first time you have prayed that prayer, there is a, a party and, and a wonderful roaring sound in heaven for you returning to the arms of the Father. And, and Lord, I pray for your revival to start. To start right now, to pour your spirit out, to pour it out abundantly, to overflow, to touch every single heart in this building so that when they go back out, they will be contagious, Lord. And I pray that throughout the week that you will guide them, you will strengthen them, you will protect them, that what the enemy means for evil, you mean for good, and that you will be in every single inch of their life, that your presence will permeate every single position in their life, every single person in their life, so that when they go out, they will continue to spread the gospel, Lord, that they will be a shining light for you, Jesus, that they will show you off so that you can show out, God, so that you can return to this nation that so desperately needs you, God. And I pray, Lord, that we begin to get... People in office that are Christians, people in office that follow your name, Jesus, that not just confess it for political commercials and political reasons so they can get a vote, but so that we can get a godly person back in office, God, in every inch, not just the White House, but every local area everywhere, not just St. Augustine, Lord, but throughout the entire nation, Lord, through every school board, through every teacher, through every law office, through every courthouse, God, every single place, Lord, let your presence be poured back out and your strength and your spirit come back and reinvigorate a land, Lord, just like Israel felt the pains of when we when they distanced themselves from you, God. We have been feeling the pains because our country has distanced itself from you. But I decree and I declare right now in Jesus' name, God, that we will be returning to you. And we are the remnant, God, that will stir the people's hearts back up. And the revival will start here. And the revival will start in other areas, God. And there will be more than just 3,000 people a day coming to you, God, that this will be a spiritual epidemic and in a contagious Christianity that that will shut out the darkness, that will shut out the depression, that will shut out the brokenness, that will kick sh uh, sin and shame to the curve, God. I pray, Lord, that you come back into this land, fill our hearts and overflow your spirit into us, God. And put this nation, put yourself back at the center of this nation. Put yourself back in our schools. Put yourself back where you need to be, God. Mm. Amen. Amen. Hey, I hope that message spoke to you today. I want to say thank you to everybody who is involved at Family Church and those who help support this ministry. If you would like to get more involved, you can click the link in the description or head to our website, familychurch.social. We would love to connect with you, and you can find all of our social media platforms on our website. Also, if this message spoke to you in any way today and you liked it, consider sharing it on your social media in any way that you would like so that we can help reach those far from God and return them to the arms of the Father. We want to see God work through you. We love you. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.